Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have a hard time with waiting. Or actually, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. I am happy to wait if I have something to do. Give me a book and I can wait for hours. Or give me a plan, a to-do list, something to accomplish. Give me a season like Advent or Lent, an intentional, structured time of waiting, and I am all in. I don't mind waiting as long as it feels productive. Like the waiting is getting me somewhere. What I have a hard time with is unstructured waiting. When I don't have anything to do. I get anxious and disoriented in those in-between kind of times. But of course, the scriptures are full of these in-between times. And more often than not, they seem to be marked by the number 40. Noah builds an ark, and for 40 days and 40 nights, God floods the earth with rain. Moses leads the Hebrew people out of Egypt, and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years before entering the Promised Land. And while they're wandering, Moses goes up Mount Sinai to receive God's law and spends 40 days on the mountaintop before coming down. Jesus retreats to the wilderness for 40 days to fast and pray and be tempted by the devil. And then in the book of Acts, after the resurrection, Jesus spends 40 more days on earth with his disciples, teaching them and commissioning them before he finally ascends to heaven. Before you worry that I'm going on some woo-woo numerology kick, don't. 40 is not a magic number. It's just a biblical way of saying a long time. <laughs> Too long, at least that's how it feels for the people waiting. 40 days is more than a month. It's long enough for the Hebrew people to get antsy, to worry that Moses has forgotten about them up on that holy mountain, and to ask Aaron to make them a golden calf that they can worship instead. Forty years is a generation, half a lifetime. Long enough that by the time the Israelites make it to the Promised Land, a whole new generation of leaders is in charge. But at least 40 is a structured period of time, right? It's a good whole round number. This morning's reading from Acts that Joanne read for us takes place after the disciples spend those 40 days with their resurrected Lord and Jesus ascends into heaven. Before he goes, Jesus tells them to stay in Jerusalem and to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But he won't tell them when or how long or what to do in the meantime. This is the kind of waiting I do not like. The gospel, salvation history, has been unfolding at breakneck speed before them, and now suddenly everything grinds to a halt. Hurry up and wait. The disciples are stuck in the in-between. We live much of our lives in the in-between, too, don't we? In between getting the biopsy done and hearing the results. In between submitting the application or the grant and finding out if you were indeed selected. In between the positive pregnancy test and the birth of the baby, or more germane to our experience perhaps, the positive COVID test and the five days later when you can leave home. In between the decision put our loved one in hospice care, and the moment when they do take their last breath. Our lives are full of in-between times. 
And rarely are they as dramatic as Moses on Mount Sinai or the resurrected Jesus appearing to his disciples. <coughs> Mostly, in these in-between times, we simply live our lives and wait. I wonder, what is it that you're waiting for? Luke spins, Luke wrote Acts, remember, he spins the better part of a chapter describing this in-between time. He tells us that the disciples go and gather in an upper room, maybe the upper room. We get a roll call of the twelve, now eleven, apostles, and a few of the others with them, members of Jesus' family, and they devote themselves to prayer. Pretty uneventful. I sure be getting squirmy. The rest of chapter one is spent in a conversation of how to replace Judas. They cast lots, they choose a man named Matthias, and then they stay in that upper room and they just wait. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? These people had left their whole lives behind to follow Jesus. For three years, they wandered with this itinerant preacher. They witnessed miracles, healings, feedings, demons cast out. They watched as their Lord was crucified and then rose from the dead and appeared to them with scars in his hands and ascended into heaven. And now what? Is this it? Is this how the story ends? Can you imagine? Or maybe you can imagine. Maybe you know that feeling well. We are a people who spend a lot of time in between. And maybe it doesn't surprise you that they were constantly devoting themselves to prayer because when we're waiting, when we're stuck in the in-between, what else can we do but pray? There is something else that they do, though. Something so obvious we may have missed it. The disciples wait, and they pray, and they stay together. Luke tells us that the disciples were all together so many times in the first few chapters of Acts, it almost feels excessive. Verse 6 goes, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time that you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 14, all these disciples were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women. Verse 15, together the crowd numbered about 120 persons. Chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Chapter 2, verse 44, all who believed were together and they had all things in common. You made your point, Luke. The disciples waited and they prayed, but most of all they were together. Jesus is gone. The Holy Spirit is yet to come. This is a disorienting time for the early church. They are viscerally aware of the absence of God. But the disciples stick it out together. And you know what I think happened? I think they realized that God was not absent at all, but they began to meet God in one another. I think they started to experience that mysterious divine presence in their interactions, filling the space between them when they gathered. I think they started to understand in a way that they have never had before what Jesus meant when he said, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. If the main character of Luke's first narrative, the gospel, is Jesus. The main character of his second narrative, the book of Acts, is the church. 
empowered by the Holy Spirit, the church in Acts goes on to do every single thing that Jesus did. They teach, preach, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, forgive sins. When Jesus ascends into heaven, the angels tell the disciples not to stand there with their necks craned toward the sky looking for Jesus, for that is not where we will find him, not anymore. Instead, we meet our Lord when we care, heal, pray, when we fix our eyes on one another. <clears throat> the church has been in a long period of waiting. For what? We're not always sure. For Christ to return or God's kingdom to come. For prayers to be answered or callings to be made clear. For justice, for mercy, for peace, <clears throat> for joy. So friends, let's take a page out of the Apostles' book. We too live in that in-between time and are called to that horrible but holy work of unstructured waiting. Let us do it together. <laughs>